digitaljamsessions.com. Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam session. Today we're joined by Anastasia from Indiegogo and Zoe from Ada, Ada, Ada. So first of all, ladies, thank you so much for joining me. I'd like for you to take a moment and just introduce yourselves and what it is you do in your respective businesses. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for having me, Tanya. It's great to be part of the show. So uh, my name is Anastasia and I run hardware design and technology for Indiegogo in the UK. Uh, Indiegogo is the largest global crowdfunding platform. We've seen over 400,000 campaigns from 224 countries and territories. And my job is basically working with amazing entrepreneurs and innovators and inventors and helping them get their products to market. Wonderful. And Zoe, tell us more about what you do. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me, Tanya. Nice to meet you, Anastasia. Lovely to meet you, too. Um, I'm Zoe Philpott. I'm an interactive storyteller with over 20 years in uh, theatre, doing multimedia theatre, what it was called back in the day, and then also in tech, having started my first technology company in 99, putting video online, and that was for dial-up. So <laughs> we had lots and lots of fun there. Um, and I've continued to work in digital all the time and I've continued to work telling stories using interactive technology, but also analog technology and working in both marketing. So I've, I've worked with uh, the robots that build cars and choreograph them for, for Ford for their global auto show. And then what I'm doing at the moment is um, I'm telling the story of Ada Lovelace using uh, hopefully technology she would be proud of. We felt like we wanted to use something that, that would make her heart sing. And that's uh, creating a dress using LEDs. And that will tell the story of her life and the amazingness that she did. Which brings me to the, the roundabout topic for today's session, which was that I found it quite fascinating because I've known Anastasia, uh, since, since, gosh, GlazedCon last year. Yeah. That's yeah, a, a while. It's been a while. And I came across Zoe because of the Ada, Ada, Ada show. And uh, I'd never heard of Ada Lovelace. And I was fascinated to discover that apparently, and I don't know if you know this one or not, Anastasia, uh, Ada Lovelace is considered as the original or first programmer, computer programmer in the world. This was back in, what was it, 1843? Yes, she, um, she came up with the first computer program in 1843 and then was promptly written out of history. She was mentioned again in Alan Turing's notes on artificial intelligence 100 years later that's wow. the difference and then he only he mentioned her as as an aider the aider objection the idea that, that she said that computers could only do what you program them to do whereas he was saying that they could do more than that but if you think about it she created this program before there was a computer which is fascinating but 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 for me it was interesting to note this this idea that women in technology tend to not be something that we hear a great deal about. And and Anastasia, I think you might be better positioned and placed to comment on this, given your role within Indiegogo, but also with so many different tech startups and new startups that you kind of get a hand in or you get to see what they're doing. Do you you feel that we're, we're coming to that shifting point now with more women perhaps being in prevalent roles or kind of leading these types of businesses? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, you know, we are definitely by far not there yet. Uh, but I think that things have changed and shifted over the last sort of five, 10 years. And particularly, you know, we're lucky we work in the startup space where essentially as a job, we have to be disruptive in whatever we're doing. And so I think, you know, diversity and different genders, different backgrounds is a huge benefit within a startup. And I'm lucky to be surrounded by, you know, our company's 47% women. And I'm surrounded by really strong female empowered women who are at the top of their game. You know, we have a female founder, Danae Ringelman, she came up with the idea of Indiegogo. And it was very much about trying to democratize access to capital. And that was for anybody, anywhere in the world. Mm. Um, And, you know, you look at kind of the startup investment scene, and it's around about, it's between 8 and 12% of VC money that goes into female-led startups. And then you look at the mm. crowdfunding landscape, and on Indiegogo, over 48% of successful campaigns are women-led. 
Um, and that kind of draws the question, you know, mm. is it because the crowd is much more representative of society? Um, you know, it's because it's le- leveling the playing field. But there's some really interesting questions around around kind of that equality in terms of getting those ideas funded. That's extraordinary to hear, Anastasia, because yeah. I'm, I'm, the first thing that's amazing to know is that there's 47% women in Indiegogo, which is brilliant. I really am so happy to know that. I didn't yeah. know that before. Because the statistics actually show, and I double checked them because I got questioned when I made this point in the show, um, by a woman, in fact, in tech. And the statistics with this country is actually, it's less than 15% of women in tech mm-hmm. yeah. jobs in this country out of, uh, you know, referred to as 85% men. And of that, there's only 9% within that 15% that are in senior roles. Yeah. And it's so misrepresentative, re, re, sorry, misrepresentative of, of the society. And like you say about the 12% versus the 48%, that again is, is I think far more typical and far more telling and how important crowdfunding as a form of investment is. Because I think that kind of fact that it is, if 48% of successful businesses are led by women in your statistics, that mm-hmm. kind of demonstrates that actually it's, the sort of, I don't know, the chip on the shoulder of society that the VCs are still got, that but, it's women in, in tech is not really that vital as, as men or but, any other diversity. Now, now I, I'm very aware that we don't have any guys on the session. And the reason, yeah. reason for that is because <laughs> I, I warned them who was going to be on the session and what we might be discussing, and all of them said no. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. What? And I'm, I'm, I'm calling out all the guys that I asked. They all know who they are. Eight of them, eight of them I asked, and eight of them went, "Oh, I don't know." Um, um, do they not think that they could uh, stand yeah. up against our, our arguments? So, well, I just I, before a beef with the guys. Some of my favourite feminists are men. <laughs> but, but I wanted to clarify to anybody listening before they think that this is a bunch of women going off on a rant yeah. against men that that is not the case we did yeah. invite some guys to come join this session we just unfortunately schedules would not allow and it couldn't happen but in light of that I'm going to take the the kind of the neutral stance here and just kind of quantify and qualify that actually there is to a certain degree in VC funding circles and the way that funding works. And so in our kind of industry, Anastasia, there is a certain degree of it is about who you know, it's about your network. And fundamentally, those networks tend to be more guy orientated. It's kind of a bit more old school than, than, you know, people might think. So actually, if you are a woman who's coming into these industries new and doesn't know anybody, it's kind of normal as much for a guy who doesn't know anybody in these industries that you're not going to know the right people to go to to ask for money. So I don't think it's 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 all necessarily to do with the fact that men don't want to invest in women's businesses so much as actually it is is very much a case of who do you know in this industry and and you know how many connections do you have to get you to the money that you're trying to you know to fundraise. Agree, totally agree. But I think that talks to a more systemic problem mm. that yes. the the people holding the purse strings are men. And the fact that, you know, it's, I, I don't think it's necessarily even about women not knowing who to talk to. It's just that at the top of the game, you look at the C-suite across any industry, not just tech, mm. and it's predominantly male. Mm, and, yes. you know, obviously we work in tech. It's a very male-oriented world, but I'm surrounded by amazing women doing amazing stuff. Mm, mm. And many of them are, you know, securing VC funding and doing really great things. But it's, it's you know, there's a lot of systemic issues around those hierarchies mm. and getting women to a much more, um, you know, authoritative position so that they can then kind of feed that down. And now there's a, there's a lot of VC companies, venture capital firms that are looking for women, because if you think about it, you know, you're going to have a much more diverse and kind of varied approach to the the businesses that you're investing in if you have a woman as a partner in a VC firm. And, you know, there is stats, I can't remember exactly what it is, but there were stats to say that um, women that were on the board of a company, the companies were much more successful Mm. commercially. Mm. Yeah, I've I've read that. There's some articles. And I agree. I think it's much more a society thing. It's not particularly that, that men are actively seeking to only fund men or something like that. It's very much, as to use your word, systemic. And this is the main drive behind doing this uh, show, Ada, 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 is to develop positive role models that aren't just for women. Obviously, she is a woman who was amazing, very much in an era which was very much against women demonstrating that sort of outlook. And 
it's about creating those positive role models now for, for women and men and all the di diversity of people to, to say it doesn't need to be what we've got. It can be other people. It can be whoever. Mm. It's just about getting up and, and, and demonstrating that you can do it. You know, the interesting part of this that I, I think there's something more to be said on, um, Anastasia, actually, is uh, around what you were talking about, which is that there is this, this imbalance in terms of how the traditional fundraising landscape works versus how fundraising in, in, in a crowdsourcing environment works and that there are more female-led businesses being funded in this crowdsourcing environment, in this social audience-style environment. And so I am curious, from your perspective, do you do you feel that there is... is anything particularly different about the way that people communicate themselves on a crowdfunding platform in terms of the way that they might pitch themselves traditionally to a VC, for example? Do you, do you think there's something there that's maybe striking a different chord with people or do you think it's just purely because of the platform and the environment of the platform? No, absolutely it is. I mean, if you look at, so I can only talk for Indiegogo, we're a rewards-based platform, so there's mm. no equity involved. So it's not a, compar a completely comparative you know, two different, the same thing. You can't compare them mm. exactly. And I think that if you actually talk to a lot of the equity platforms, crowdfunding equity platforms, uh, the numbers are still skewed towards male businesses. Okay. Um, so there's definitely an, a kind of, it's around the way that you're pitching it, but you're not, ta you're not talking about your business plan. You're not talking about your EBIT. You're not working through your financial forecasts. Crowdfunding, rewards crowdfunding is very much about selling the idea, like the storytelling behind it, you know, explaining what this project or product is. And therefore, you know, the crowd fall in love with the idea and they're kind of almost less concerned with who's behind it, but also very concerned with who's behind it because they're excited about the team. But I don't think there's that same level of bias when you're looking at a crowdfunding campaign. So, you know, a couple of examples recently. Um, one campaign was Jibo. So it's a, a, a robot, the mm -hmm. world's first human robot funded last summer and raised over $2.7 million. And it's a female bioscientist. It's her brainchild. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the question is, would that have got funded? They just closed a $25 million VC round a couple of about six months after their crowdfunding campaign because, you know, they validated their audience. They have a huge amount of data against their customers and clearly they, you know, the people want it. And so gathering that VC money is much easier. And I think that is a really interesting proof point for women trying to validate their businesses to get further funding. And, you know, another really good example is um, Ariel Garten. She created a brainwave sensing headband called Muse. And she was actually struggling to get VC money. You know, she's creating something that's pretty out there, you know, innovative of her time, a brainwave sensing headband that you can control and, mm. you know, use your brainwaves to get more relaxed or excited and all that kind of thing. And the VCs, you know, it's, it's risky. Hardware in itself is very risky. But then adding on to that something that's quite innovative, she couldn't get funding. Mm. And whether that's because she was a woman as well, I'm not going to make comment. Mm. But she raised, you know, she validated that people did want the product. And a couple of months afterwards, she raised a, 10, a $6 million round. And about a month ago, she raised another $10 million round. So here's the thing. You keep on using the word validate and validation. And I'm going to go back to that phrase that I threw out there during GlazeCon. <laughs> <laughs> which was social audiences, the the concept of using crowdfunding platforms to validate product or audiences. And I think that what, what you're talking about there is actually the, the use, the, the, the exact demonstration of this phrase, which is the use by, okay, women in this instance, but any business to use a crowdfunding platform to actually validate that they do have an audience there, that there is some reason for traction behind that business, and then go on to use that as a step in the process towards VC funding or further investment. Now, that for me is an interesting shift in the way that people perceive crowdfunding platforms as a whole, getting away from the whole gender issues, but as a whole, the, the notion that actually people have begun to understand that crowdfunding is not in and of itself is not the be-all and the end-all of the funding, but merely a step in the process of funding. Do you think that that's, that's you know, the, the, the kind of the parity of, of where we are now with crowdfunding? Absolutely. I mean, I constantly harp on about the fact that crowdfunding is not about the money. Mm. It's about everything else. And the money is kind of a side project. Mm. Um, you know, it's about validating and getting your idea out there, market testing, testing your marketing message, getting PR, 
creating this group of evangelists who will shout from the rooftops how much they love your thing or your project or your film or your your band mm. um, and then go using that to then you know go on and do a lot of the other things that you want to do and open those doors whether that is investment or whether it's you know getting a studio to sign you whatever it is that you're trying to achieve crowdfunding is very much a stepping stone and within the hardware sphere which is what I work in it's becoming a very mandatory step you know if you talk to any investor they're going to ask you well have you crowdfunded have you proved that people want it have you you know refined your product market fit because the two things that investors are worried about is market risk and execution risk and both of those things you can mitigate by crowdfunding exactly so so i'm interested as well to hear your thoughts on the shift in entertainment and crowdfunding because what we found is that there's a huge shift now in uh, independent studios whether it's gaming or film deciding to crowdfund the, the you know the, the film or, or the the game project rather than go after traditional funding routes or di- for traditional uh, distribution routes and a really really great example of this was actually one that was on your platform which was the the conman um, series by Nathan Fillon and, and Alan Tudyk probably pronounce his name terribly wrong sorry but these guys are are part of this kind of this new generation of entertainment producers if you like and content producers who really do view crowdfunding and crowdfunding platforms as a distribution model rather than as as again just another funding you know source they they actually see it as as a a precursor to to sale I would also add theatre to that as well, and not just mm-hmm. theatre, but the whole sort of idea of communicating, having a product that is going to go out mm-hmm. to primarily entertain. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, that's, how do you... that's, that's exactly our, our model for using crowdfunding. Yeah, I was going to ask you, sorry, what's your kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, what platforms well, do you use and what do you are, find most useful? Um, we've, uh, got, we've been going through a big learning curve because um, I've obviously been aware of crowd, crowdfunding for lots and lots of things, and I've followed other people doing it and decided to implement it as part of our funding strategy and went to a very good conference with Crowdfinders earlier this yeah. year um, that was very interesting and got an opportunity to meet many, and I know it's a burgeoning market. We we initially felt that we wanted to go with a, a, a someone that was very specifically in the entertainment industry, but what we're thinking of for this autumn is, and we did we did that initially as a way of raising awareness for primarily for a specific event we were creating. So that's, that's kind of happened now and that was very successful and we've got a, we've kind of built a small tribe on the back of that. Um, we're now going this, this autumn to, again, to go to crowdfunding more as a supporting role within our funding strategy to, again, raise awareness, build a voice for the product and as we build the tour, because we're, we're going to be going up to Manchester is the first science festival we're doing, but we're going to be touring around all science festivals next year as well. And so it's this real sort of sense of um, putting us out there, and it has the the the, the, the fact that, it, as you say, the bo- the byproduct of actually raising money is brilliant because that gives people a very much they've got the emotional um, interest in the story. They then have the the journey that they take with us through we we you know we carry them along with the story of of what's actually going on, the trials and tribulations of bringing the story to life, and then by making the financial investment and helping us deliver that. It's definitely a bind, it binds the community. We obviously appreciate every penny that's donated. There's no doubt about that. But we don't see it as almost a source of all the money we're going to need to deliver. It's just that is part of the, 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 the funding process. But more, it's the, it's the knowing that we've got the community out there, knowing that they know about us. Some, we've had, we've had a, an effect that I know a school is now aware of Ada Lovelace that wasn't before because I got told through the community that because they found out about the show on the crowdfunding site, they now, the local school knows about Ada Lovelace because their, their daughter went in as Ada Lovelace one That's day. Amazing. That's amazing. I know. So, cool. so now so she, got, cool. she got given a reward. She got given a, um, a, a certificate to say she taught the school something. And awesome. It's so awesome. So now that school is going to be teaching Ada Lovelace as a positive role model for women and everyone in tech um, forever. That's really cool. Well, for I, your new crowdfunding campaign, you should you should check out Miss Possible. It's an yes. amazing campaign. I don't know, have you seen it? No, not yet. Okay, so uh, anyone for the listeners, it's an amazing campaign. 
two women who wanted to, again, like shine a light on these amazing role models that we have in history mm. that possibly were, you know, cast over a little bit like Ada Lovelace. So there's Marie Curie and Ada Lovelace, lots of women. And they've created this whole doll series based on these oh, female yes. scientists, engineers, role models. Um, it did really, really well, you know, raised a lot of money, but again, raised a lot of awareness mm, and yeah. trying to kind of change that conversation because everyone's focused on how do we get more women in STEM? How do we, you know, retain that talent? And a lot of it is about awareness and education yeah. and tr- trying to kind of, you know, showcase that a lot of women are doing amazing things. And, you know, you kind of picked up on the point earlier. It's not, you know, women just shouting about this. Men are very passionate about it as well. And if we're going to ever get anything done, then we have to include them because mm. they're 50% of the population mm-hmm. and they're the majority of the STEM population. So mm-hmm. it needs to be a conversation that both parties are, you know, taking part in. And Absolutely. And we shouldn't be blaming anyone for what's gone before. We should be no. getting on with changing what's what happens now. Okay. Forward. Just because uh, I am actually, uh, I have a, a side interest in, in the UN as a trustee for, for UN Influx, I am going to shout it out there. Um, to those who are listening, who, who have listened all the way through to this point, I'm going to suggest you go and you look on the UN's website at the He For She campaign. Regardless of if you mm-hmm. are male or female, yeah. go have a look because it's fine for us to rant, but it'd be better if you took action. So having said that, <laughs> done, my, done my little bitch. Um, That's good. <laughs> Very good point. What I'm going to say is this. Based on what Anastasia is saying, based on what you're saying as well, Zoe, I think one of the key learnings that we've we've kind of taken from this conversation is that actually crowdfunding is not about funding and that defining and proving the audience is is definitely the way that you can get value from the platform. But what I would be interested to understand, Anastasia, from your perspective, perhaps, is what do you think is going to be the next significant technology shift, cultural thinking, trend, whatever that thing is, that you think will significantly impact the landscape for crowdfunding in the next five to 10 years? It's such a fast moving industry. You know, even the last two years that I've been with Indiegogo, mm. so much has changed. The market's developed, the crowd's become a lot more savvy. Mm. Um, so it's pretty hard to predict where it's going to be in sort of five, 10 years. But one thing that's very much changing in the category or vertical that I focus on, which is technology, is that it's changing the way that products are made. Mm. So you have tiny startups, SMEs, massive brands like Sony and Philips, all leveraging Indiegogo as a platform for market testing and to get their product out there and to engage the community, as Zoe said, which is so important. And I think we're going to start seeing even more of that. You know, the idea that p- products were made in a dark room and then it was all stealth mode and then you waited and waited and then you released it and you prayed and drank whiskey and hoped that it was a success. <laughs> I think that era is gone. Mm. I think that people, you know, the the crowd, you know, you, me, who wants to buy the next drone or the next wearable device, uh, the next sleep tracker, we want to know where it's being made. We want to know that more about the factories. We want, to, we want to know who the people are behind that product. And I think we're going to start demanding that not only from the smaller brands, but also the larger consumer electronic brands that are that are out there. Mm. And so I think this kind of transparency in the way that products are made is going to be really important. And, you know, obviously there's going to be a continuation of the accessibility, you know, things like 3D printing and those technologies that allow for rapid prototyping has lowered the barrier to entry for a lot of people. And, you know, mix in with that crowdfunding, you have anyone anywhere who's empowered to bring their product to market. So it, we're, we're starting to see, and we've already seen this very much leveled landscape where the people at CES, for example, you know, 10 years ago, that would be dominated by the huge brands. Now it's really the startups that own that you know, that area, the Eureka zone, and you walk around and it's just full of people that are small teams hustling, getting their ideas out there. And that's the exciting part, not, you know, the huge brands. So I think it's just going to be a continuation of of both the big brands and the small companies working together Mm -hmm. and the crowd, the people out there wanting to know much more about where their products are coming from. Absolutely. Zoe, I'm interested to hear from your perspective. In terms of the immersive theatre landscape, I think there's a lot of really rapid changes happening in the space. And we're seeing a lot of new emerging shows, especially in places like London and New York, and and now more as well in LA. We're we're seeing people like Punch Drunk and Alice's Adventures Underground and Generation of Z and all these different shows that are really drawing people in and immersing them in the entertainment 
what what do you think is the future for for immersive entertainment from your perspective? Well, from from my perspective, it's very exciting the way that the landscape has changed. It's also I'm aware that personally, I haven't done theatre inside a theatre since 2002 because I wanted to go to where the audiences were, and first and theatre wasn't something that most people engaged with. It was very much a set sort of type of person that that generally went to the theatre, and that hasn't changed. It still is. So what's very exciting about this change in landscape is that I think, you know, you've got your punch drunks, you've got your, your, the vaults, what's going on with the, the Alice Underground and things like that. But you've also got things which are even more stealth-like that aren't calling themselves theatre, but are using theatre practices, using this immersive and interactive way of, of, of engaging people in stories mm. that can be perceived as, as theatre by, say, someone who recognises it being, oh, that's immersive theatre. But actually, it'll be happening in nightclubs. It will be happening in stations. It will be happening everywhere, and people won't call it immersive theatre. People will just call it whatever they feel like calling it there and then. And there'll be this general sort of, um, I'd say, convergence, but actually it's a, di- it's a diversity of media, meaning it just doesn't stay in one place, and it uses lots of different media to tell the story, and that's what's exciting. So where you have something like You, Me, Bum Bum Train, which had one person and probably about 100 people that were involved in the back the back side of it, excuse the pun, but you, and then you have something like Punch Up, which has several hundred people going through every 45 minutes at times. It's about how diverse it's going to be. And some things will be more filmic and some things will be more installation-based. I, I know that I've been involved in several TV adverts that have used interactive theater as the experience that they then shoot Mm. so it's you know that this is this is kind of happening and i think to say that it will stay as theater is probably the bit which will change okay lovely well before we depart what i'm going to ask you both to do ladies is to share with us your relevant twitter handle or social media handle whatever it is that you would normally use to allow people to follow you stalk you or just generally know all about what you're up to uh, anastasia what's yours mine is at mini anastasia because if anyone's ever met me i'm definitely not not uh, got much height on me so it's at mini anastasia on twitter and i tweet about all things technology women empowerment crowdfunding so if you like hearing that kind of a rant then definitely follow me <laughs> and zoe what about you um, the best handle to reach me on on twitter is at ada the show and there i do a bit similar to anastasia i do talk about positive role models for women in STEM. I share great stories that are happening and competitions that are going out for people to get involved with different parts of being women in tech and generally ranting about that too and connecting with other (laughs) wonderful people who agree and wish to spread the word further. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us on today's show and thank you for listening. If you enjoy this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe and review and thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, guys. DigitalJamSessions.com